Okay, so we have our regular uh, uh, our regular mail, which starts with priest Romanos Regado. And but his point size is it's, it's, it's too small. Oh no, no, we have this now. No, it's good. I sort of sense the Russian Greek love hate relationship. I'm not sure if, if there is love part, if this part, if there is any love left there, but I, I think I committed a mistake on this one because explain I, yourself. I was I was I was uh, reading a tab that the uh, part of tab. tab the tab tab and the computer okay, okay. that's part of the tab in your <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it's sort of written also. It feels, no, 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 it, it works. Now, re read it to uh, Mr. Patrick that he I, can see. So I sort of sense that uh, there's a Rus the Russian Greek love hate relationship of Moscow and uh, of Russia and uh, Greece, of uh, Constantinople, affected the uh, point of view of Metropolitan Anthony and Tanando because there are some. Uh, there are some points that uh, he was strict. Sometimes and there are things that he, there are things that he are willing to, to copy the Greeks. With. Greeks are, or sometimes it's just a reaction on what the Greeks are doing. So he's not doing it. <laughs> so uh, I mean, is it is this? Uh, I, I sort of felt an animosity regarding Constantinople. So is it is this the reason why he? Uh, um, felt comfortable transferring to Serbia? Uh, or, Pat Pat or, or is it him who... Patrick, uh, yes. did, you, did, you get, did you get sense of Father Romano's question? Uh, he's saying that Metropolitan Anthony... Oh, no, you uh, don't need, I'm, I'm sorry, you do need to summarize. You just, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. You, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you do need to summarize, I'm sure. If... <laughs> yes, I heard. No, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not elementary school, no, it's fine. <laughs> So, uh, right, As answering this question, uh, what, what is fair to mention that Metropolitan Antony had reputation in Russia as uh, Phil Elinos. When, when the, the, he was really very uh, a Greekophile, oh, okay. a Greekophile. And, and, and he, uh, uh, he was the one who invited to Russia Patriarch of Antioch to celebrate its 300th anniversary of the House of Romanos. Mm -hmm. And in Moscow, Dormition Cathedral, for like for a few hundred years, for a couple hundred of years, they finally saw patriarchal office. And he made sure that it would be really very pontifical. Mm -hmm. So, if, if uh, Orthodox bishops in the East knew someone, it would be Metropolitan Anthony. Mm -hmm. So he really had a lot of respect for uh, Greeks. And one of key answers to this would be that his hero, his superhero, was Patriarch Nikon. Mm -hmm. And during uh, the council 1917-1918, he made sure that uh, participants would go on a field trip to Patriarch Nikon's uh, grave nearby Moscow. So that, in this sense, as you, as, you, as you know, Patriarch Nikon, he uh, believed uh, that Russian church had to be in conformity with uh, the Greek church. So Metropolitan, I'm not sure to what extent Metropolitan Anthony believe that uh, there should be update and we should really, the Patriarch Nikon kind of more slavishly, more slavishly followed the Greek church in various details, basically like he really took it as a benchmark. I don't think Metropolitan Anthony has this idea of keeping contemporary Greek orthodoxy as benchmark but definitely he had feeling of one uh, universal Orthodox church. But when he found himself outside of Russia, vis-a-vis uh, -vis this new uh, theology 
of, of, of the ecumenical patriarchate. It's called diaspora belong to ecumenical patriarchate when the ecumenical patriarchate uh, took uh, those districts, ecclesiastical districts that belong to the Russian church, plus also those reforms, right? Uh, Father Patrick, by the way, who will be talking tomorrow, he's an expert on uh, the calendar reform. And he was explaining how long it is that it was a process of many years because of the problems in Greece. It's not just came uh, suddenly or like uh, just because of any Western influence. There also were profound uh, inner reasons why they uh, implemented this reform. But things like that, they were uh, foreign to metropolitan Antony. And I caught, I caught a glimpse of Leo's question today. So we'll come to full extent. But uh, a thought that uh, came across my mind when I saw his question, that Metropolitan Antony, he was a convert. Not in a sense like the three of us here in this room, or like four of us actually, by the way, in this class, but he uh, grew up in class divided uh, Russian, Rus uh, Russian pre-revolutionary empire. And his parents were noblemen, and therefore his uh, life supposed to be either military or service. And he somehow uh, got across this class divide, and he became monastic with a very, how to say, uh, kind of when you are growing up, when you are, as, as they call here, a PK, priest kid. Mm -hmm. It's kind of your life, you didn't choose it. Mm -hmm. And you might like it, you might really, how to say, be grateful, or you might just hate it as anything that we didn't choose. So he became an ide idealist, and that also explains, uh, I, I probably just answered the question that Leo uh, uh, said, and that's why he, his monarchism was of different nature that basically monarchism of people who just uh, pay lip service because that's how it was. He, it was part of his philosophy. He profoundly believed in monarchism. I don't think there were that many people who really kind of had this as part of their, what they now like to say, pronima, part of their kind of worldview mindset. So for him, it was very important. It was like a, basically a pillar as kind of a, a restrainer. So, so he didn't really see, uh, I mean, he wasn't, he was unwilling to see blind spots of monarchism. That's, that's another thing with Metropolitan Anthony, that he, he wasn't a scholar. He reminds Father Alexander Schmemann, or Father Alexander Schmemann, better to say, reminds him. Because both, both people, they were visionary, but neither, neither of them was a scholar, a researcher, and another, well, I should, no, I don't know, I'm going to say it. Yeah, so basically, and that's, that's kind of, they were very good about popular, popularizing things. They had their pets, you know, like for Metropolitan Anthony, that would be like moral theology, uh, for Father Alexander, that would be probably like Eucharistic renewal and so on. Uh, so that, so those were their pets. But I think it's there is some similarity. Okay, so now uh, let's see the other question from uh, Father Roman. Let's see the other question. So what, what was the reception of this notion of academic monasticism? In Russia. Right. So, so for, for again, for Patrick, how was uh, Metropolitan Antony's view of academic monasticism received in pre revolutionary Russia in diaspora period? I assume the diaspora this has been put aside for a while. You mean basically, I, I believe it was negative view of uh, academic monasticism, right? It, it, um, that's, that's how I sense it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, but if you think about Metropolitan Anastasia, who, who, who is with us here, right, he was an academic monk. Mm -hmm. If you think basically 
that's something that Bishop Gabriel, if you think about of Canada, he some extent also comes to this. I think our, our current metropolitan, he also comes to this because they they were tortured months elsewhere. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't come like from Jordanville Monastery. And Metropolitan Antony's uh, response to challenges to like uh, graduate students with wine and cigarettes and so on was basically to have a seminary uh, uh, within within the monastery, so kind of Jordanville, to some extent, can be called his uh, brainchild. That's that's what I imagine that this is how he, this is what he wants. Right, and since this, since I live this life, <laughs> I live this life. I'm not that I'm not that how to say excited about this. But but at the same time, at the same time, he was excited about the foundation of. Saint Serge Geological uh, Institute in Paris. Mm -hmm. He really liked this idea, but what happened later, and just the, the Saint Serge Geological Institute was founded in 1925. And next year, there was a schism in diaspora. So that's something that affected, uh, uh, affected the, the whole uh, development of this institute. So it was it happened to be outside of Metropolitan Antony's reach. And I'm not sure uh, if Metropolitan Anthony would be comfortable with various professors who taught there and so on. Maybe there would, sooner or later, there would be conflict. But at the same time, uh, Metropolitan Anthony was often more broad than uh, bishops around him. That's also you deal with another news question. Because when I was working this June with YMCA archives in uh, Urbana, Champaign, uh, Illinois University. There was one letter of Metropolitan Antony to YMCA. So basically, YMCA, the Russian YMCA, wanted to publish one pamphlet. Metropolitan Antony was saying, I have no problems that you publish it, but I'm sorry, you know, my, my, my peers, they, they decided that we shouldn't really work with you. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, there were cases like that. Uh, like uh, his correspondence with Gardiner, with Robert Gardiner, he was saying that uh, we we are going we are going to witness about orthodoxy to an ecumenical meeting. So it's a good thing we should meet, we should talk. So a kind of was for like non compromise, basically ecumenism, where people listen to each other, talk, and he had he had no problem to say whatever you know he he believed was was was. Orthodox ecclesiology. So, what I mean about uh, is this: uh, I, I kind of, I kind of dealt with uh, academic monasticism uh, because it's also part of what, what I uh, conventionally uh, name as says that he was a convert because he, uh, as many of us, strove for purest version of orthodoxy. And with this purest version of orthodoxy, of course, it would be traditional Eastern, uh, Eastern uh, Byzantine or like pre-Byzantine -pre um, asceticism. So kind of uh, what he saw as a part of the, uh, as a part of the merge between the state and the church in the Russian empire, uh, wasn't something that excited him because this uh, academic uh, monasticism was was a phenomenon uh, of Russian Empire, which which had a point of reference in Roman Catholicism. Because uh, to to my uh, sort of what I'm off, what I suggest you for discussion, right? If you think about uh, uh, Roman Catholicism, right? Two weeks ago, I was at the conference in Rome, right? So a conference was held in Angelicum, uh, which uh, place uh, connected with uh, Thomas uh, Aquinite. There are many, many fathers study and so on. Like Roman Catholics, they have those specialization, like it, it's everything. It's very, very sorted, very organized. And Father Kiprian Kier, 
whom you also know, right, from pastoral theology of Visladika, he became a monk uh, in a monastery uh, in Serbia, the same monastery where Father Fadios or Saint Fadios, I'm not sure, he, he probably can, and I Saint Fadios or Vitovica, right? This book, your source determines your lives, right? Serbian, Serbian elder, Serbian father. So like Saint John of Shanghai, there always is this monastery, Milkova. And uh, uh, Father Kiprian Kern, who really had this inclination to study and so on, he tried to be there and he could not really, he, he could not uh, sur survive there because lifestyles was like agricultural monasteries. They didn't really have any room. And same story with uh, Timothy where in Montreal, this, uh, the future metropolitan Vitali. So that's, that's what I want to say to Father Roman. Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, uh, I don't remember exactly, besides that there, there was negativity from Metropolitan Anthony, but I don't really like remember the whole, uh, how to say, uh, his attitude with all nuances, if there were any, but that's, I guess, the best I can talk about. Okay, so now, uh, uh, Patrick, can you just maybe read your questions? Yourself. Can you? Your mic's off, Unmute yourself, please. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Father. Um, Metropolitan Anthony's attitude to, uh, towards St. Sergius uh, Seminary and also Florensky in the article um, were said to be mistrustful and weary of their new theology, although we do, um, do see sometimes that they complemented each other um, on a personal level. Um, was this kind of tension more obvious because uh, Metropolitan Anthony didn't have the same scholarly aspirations as um, St. Sergius um, school did or um, theologians like Florensky and Florovsky were, were putting forth at the time and it seemed like he was just in tension with the whole idea of this new kind of kind of understanding of doing patristic theology because it also talks about his personality and I would think that he would be more inclined to listen to it because he had some um, he had some Greek flavors of his own that he liked. And you would think this kind of return to this Greek understanding of doing theology might, might mix well with him, but it seemed like it didn't. And I was just wondering if that's because of his natural conservatism or more so just because he wasn't able to really um, deal with the work that they were, that they were putting out, which I'm not trying to make it sound rude, but like, like he wasn't just in, in, um, he wasn't able to engage with the scholarly work that was being put out at the time and just kind of ignored it in general. Right. I mean, uh, 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 George Florovsky, Georgi Vasilyevich Florovsky, who became, I believe, uh, a priest uh, very close to Metropolitan Anthony uh, last year or maybe even after that, he always had good, how to say, uh, for Metropolitan Anthony liked him a lot. So I don't think there were ever were any, any negative comments about him. About him. Father Pavel Floriansky, he remained in Russia. And since Father Pavel Floriansky, he was kind of like a polymass, right? Sort of what they called about what they called Michelangelo, right? So polymass. He really was a man of many uh, qualities. And also many, he was very, very, how to say, uh, broad, like he would look at Kabbalah and he would root at various things that for Metropolitan Anthony had very little value. Uh, I think natural, uh, natural conservatism played its role too. And uh, I, I, it's hard to assess Metropolitan Anthony in this sense, because it really would be like a proper dissertation to write uh, why he really had those uh, things. Uh, he also, Metropolitan Anthony, he easily believed various uh, negative rumors about people. 
even if just rumors were various like various misproprieties committed for people by people and so on he apparently didn't have a problem to believe and even like sharing those things as they were as they were how to, how to say if they were uh, absolute facts so it kind of gives you idea why metropolitan anthony was a little bit problematic to be uh, to be a leader of like church and so on because you are not really you should keep those things under control really mm -hmm. but uh, he was a charismatic person but at the same time luckily he was a humble man and he didn't uh, despite that maybe in some views he was uh, somehow maybe called papist but in his practical uh, practical uh, uh, in his uh, his administration style was collegial. That's why answering to in second Leo's question, when he came up with his uh, exercise, with his attempt to uh, res to rationalize uh, uh, rationalize redemption, right? So and when bishops said that with due respect, this catechism cannot be recommended uh, for uh, as official as official text because catechisms that they come from point of reference with Saint Philaret of Moscow, whose catechism considered as what they call symbolic book, as a, like uh, a symbol of stufu as a creed. Right, so and because it's very, 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 very important text. So, so coming from this understanding, they said that we cannot really recommend it because uh, it really, how to say, I, I don't know if you you talk with Father Dmitrius' class, like modern theology, where you, where you studied modern theology, theologians. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, did you talk about Metropolitan Anthony? He's, uh, we talked about him in the context of uh, Florovsky accusing him of um, a heresy, basically, which is why I was going to bring up what you said that they were close towards the end of his life. Uh, come again, please. We talked about Metropolitan Anthony um, only in the context, I think, of whether or not he actually committed a heresy when he was talking about Christ right. suffering in the garden versus Christ yeah, suffering yeah, yeah. on the cross. Um, and I was going to ask you if you um, said that him and Florovsky were actually close towards the end of his life. No, no, no. I, okay. I, 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 don't, I, I didn't say that. They never okay. were close. But Metropolitan Anthony liked Florovsky a lot. That's okay. That's yeah. Well, they... because in the reading, that's the impression I got. But I also got the impression that um, maybe because of his antagonism towards that new school of theology in general, it was easier for Florovsky to kind of call him out on this issue than, than, than it wouldn't have been for other people too. Because I know that other people called him out, but it seems like Florovsky was the one who called him out the most, um, I guess, uh, ex exhaustively where he like went down like, like he wrote like a whole book, basically not a whole book. But he wrote like a whole thing about why this was a problem. Um, and I was right. wondering, you know, and, and uh, I think it happened after his death too. So I'm not sure exactly when he wrote it. But I think it was after his death, so he couldn't respond to it, obviously. But there was but some. I believe, I believe Florovsky, uh, he uh, uh, he succeeded uh, in remaining tactful toward Metropolitan Anthony. I don't think he really. Uh, I, 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 did, I, I mean, I, I never really look into this. Uh, it's not my, you know, cup of tea, this sort of theology. But uh, I, I understand from what I heard that Florovsky even didn't mention Anthony's name in his writing. He wrote about the whole approach, but it wasn't really polemical. Mm -hmm. It was more philosophical, reflectional, and so on. But this wasn't really... So this kind of uh, 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 jurisdictional polemical that was very, very common at this time. Mm -hmm. Because Metropolitan Anthony, he was uh, attacked uh, uh, by Metropolitan Yeliferi, who was, uh, who was a hierarch of Moscow Patriarchate based in Lithuania. 
like in Lithuania, it was it was strong call to Moscow Patriarchate outside of the Soviet Union, because the whole diocese there belonged to Metropolitan Sergei Strogorodsky. So in natural Metropolitan Eleutherius became a representative of uh, the church in the Soviet Union outside of Russia, to the point that even when uh, an official journal of Moscow Patriarchate was closed down in 1934, uh, he, uh, all, all text, all official documents were published in Lithuanian periodical. So, but this also was connected with the schism, a lot of stuff was connected with the schism without this uh, division of kind of people would be willing to give more uh, space to other people to explain themselves maybe to clarify some things but yeah. there wasn't enough charity in all this you know so compare it with today huh? I think today's polarized American society is very very close to what people experienced uh, back then. Well, um, and this is a side comment. I found that some of his comments about the way that people present themselves in church seemed kind of similar to where that Spearman talked about that in, in his letters a little bit. He was kind of not a fan of people acting kind of puffed up or, you know, um, having their eyes closed a certain way or crossing themselves a certain way or kind of making prostrations or like not prostrations but uh kneeling kind of weird ways or, or like making a point to show their piety and that to me kind of resonated with something that i read in schmim and, and so i thought that was something that i think they would both have uh, agreed on which is this kind of uh you know um pompous attitude that people kind of take in church sometimes which is uh which i thought was really interesting um, because it seemed like he was very much like obvious that he didn't like it, um, and which you know which which he could be as a bishop. Um, do you want me to read my second question? Yes, yes. If if we dealt with the cross one, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Metropolitan Anthony seemed to be progressive on the question of Jewish and Muslim relations, um, and I want you to know has this view, especially when, um, in regard to the Muslim aspect, um, was it normal in the Russian hierarchy at the time? Um, I don't, I don't both know. What, and I don't know what you're talking about because I don't, I, 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 I really, nothing, nothing comes to my mind regarding Metropolitan Antony and Muslims. Um, in the article, it mentions that he said the that he would feel more comfortable around religious Jews and Muslims. Um, and then I also read that in an article published by um, the Orthodox uh, history guy, um, he was talking about St. John Kronstadt and how a lot of Tartar Muslims had a lot of respect for him. And, uh, and, and, and that made me think that maybe in general, because they were in the area where like, where like normal Russians were, if there was this kind of relationship um, between Muslims serving in like Russian areas and Russian Orthodox people, if there was a kind of relationship that was kind of like an understanding, because like even in Russia, there hasn't been a, until recently, I've heard um, that much tension between uh, between Muslims and Russians in, in general. And I was just wondering if this was like a trend in the Russian church at the time, and even still that they had this kind of like amicable relationship between um muslims and muslims and like orthodox christians um I, uh, catherine the great she gave hierarchy to muslims and also to lamaists right because as as it's kind of imperial attitude that muslims in in, in russia they received uh chief uh, uh mullah which still there until now. So kind of, it would be easy uh, for the state to deal either with uh, Muslims or Lamaists. So they all received hierarchy from the Russian state. So it was official religion, recognized religion, but Metropolitan Anthony, he felt comfortable about people 
who uh, would uh, stand for something, especially now. I mean, uh, I mean, you probably would not uh, have much time for socialists, all right? But I mean, religious people. If if somebody is how to say uh, takes his customs, his uh, rituals seriously, that would be process Metropolitan Anthony would respect. So for him, the worst thing were people who lost their faith. And in this sense, he would mention secularized Jews or Russians who followed the same pattern. So, so you might come across his anti-Semitic uh, statements, because, but also I believe uh, nature of those statements is as I just described. He was not, and I, I don't know really bishops no one comes to my mind russian church brought bishops who were how to put it boy uh there's specific word they were not they were they were not uh, uh biological anti-semites or something like that so kind uh, of well, they, they, they 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 mostly either would connect it with conspiracy theories or they would connect it with a traditional Christian anti-Semitism, uh, basically that that is rooted in uh, you know in medieval times or even like uh, older times and so on, like hatred for Jews, which is, which is can be seen uh, in a Great Friday service to some extent and so on. So, but I don't think they really hated Jews as 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 as, as human sort of. Uh, that's particular Nazi uh, anti-Semitism was of this type. Mm -hmm. Believe that Jews just basically should be exterminated and so on. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah. No, I, I was just asking because it it was a uh, really brief thing, but um, I was thinking about that plus paired with the um, aspect that in Russia, Muslims had a lot of respect for Saint John of Kronstadt. And um, some Muslims, I think it's impossible to say Muslims get some. Well, Muslims. Okay, yeah, fine, fine, fair enough, yeah, yeah. Um, so, just wondering if there was a connection because um, most, I mean, like in America, it's a pretty growing uh, group, um, religious group, and uh, there might be something in the future that like Roker has to deal with. So, just wondering if there's like any precedent on how we interact I think, with i think in america orthodox christians they 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 very they follow very close sociological uh sociological sociological data for muslims because per percent per percent wise both both groups are quite similar in numbers so american muslims and american orthodox and so on i think there is a lot of uh, ground for interesting comparison between two groups in America, and from social point of view, something maybe your wife might be might be interested in in, in taking a look at, and so on. Mm. Very dynamics between Orthodox Christians and Muslims in the U.S. But I mean, did uh, are you happy with your with uh, responses to your questions? Yes, thank you. Okay, so Leo, anything that uh, that escape regarding your questions? Yeah, I don't recall if I. Um... We discussed the document of redemption. Was there a uh, an official statement as to whether or not this is in line with the last teaching? Or is it no, the level of, uh, no, no, no. There wasn't any official statements okay. besides the fact that it was kind of already bad enough that the bishop didn't recommend this book as an official All right. All right. as an official manual. Okay, thank you. Kind of out of respect. There was they he didn't use any any word in any language that could basically would be even close to call it heresy or anything like that. But basically, Metropolitan Anthony again, uh, what we talked yesterday with with uh, David that it, it's all about attitude. And Metropolitan Anthony just said, "Listen, you know, if you have any problems with this, just don't use it." And he was he was very how to say blase. That's why I would not call him heretic, because I think I think heretic is the guy who 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 is saying, you know, I did a PhD on this, I really studied this, and you are really not of my weight class to to deal with this. This sort yeah, of me, um... it didn't have anything like that. That again shows 
that he he was a big caliber person. Yes, he his shadow is still over Russian church abroad, but Metropolitan Anthony, he wasn't an Antonian. You see what I mean? Yeah, I see. So kind of he wasn't an Antonian, he wasn't in some basically like I mean Saint Paul, Saint Apostle Paul says. You know that there is Christ. So some people saying, "I am of Kepha, I am of Apollos, and I am of Paul." He said, "So that's what he would say, Metropolitan Anthony." I'm sure. Yeah. Sorry, Patrick. What? No, I was going to say the same thing, and I think uh, I think the attitude that he had about what he wrote, I think, is what kind of separates them. Like we can go into whether or not what he wrote was accurate and what effects, but but I don't think I think his intention was pretty different from what. I guess whatever heresy uh, he was accused of, um, and I think that matters. And I think if we think about him as a pastor more than a theologian, which I think is pretty obvious, then I then I don't think it's uh, problematic. I think there are ways to correct him that you can correct almost any person without um, without trying to uh, condemn the actual person. Um, I think about how like Saint Basil during the council was a little bit weak on talking about the Holy ghost at the time, because he didn't want, you know, things to go into a spiral and St. Gregory was really upset about this, but St. Gregory doesn't go out and um, straight up call like St. Basil, like a heretic, you know, like he kind of recognizes that, you know, what St. Basil is trying to do, but he just doesn't uh, agree with it. Like he wants to be staunch and strong. And obviously like later on the church, you know, follow St. Gregory's, but um, uh, not St. Gregory, but St. Basil ultimately, but, I don't think that makes St. Basil a heretic, obviously, you know, because he had the right idea. He just was doing it in a way that I think at the time was the best plan. Um, and so that's the way I think about, um, I think about Metropolitan Anthony. I think he was writing and he wrote in a way that was not clear. And that could have brought problems, but I think because he was humble about it, it's not that big of a deal, really, unless you're basing your theology off of his one passage, you know, in this book about it. So. Right, right, but I think heresy is really okay. One may say that he is imprecise and his views were problematic, but this doesn't constitute heresy yet. Because I mean, he made his proposal, uh, and his proposal is valid because he was try he as Metropolitan Sergei Strogorodsky, they were trying to. Uh, get away from counterproductivity of school theology, which is scholastic. Because when you teach theology, uh, if you teach in a, uh, in a parish school, you really need to think, how would you talk about sacraments? So understandably, it's, it became easy to uh, break sacraments into seven categories. So, and it's even actually was proclaimed at the Council of Leon in 1274. So it really came also from the West to us. But if you think about monasticism that we talked in this class, so monasticism is really treated as kind of second baptism, right? So mm -hmm. a person sins, I raised, you cannot really go back and so on. This is not, this, this is not a sacrament. So what is this? So you see kind of you are really limiting yourself when you when you chain yourself to those numbers. And Metropolitan Anthony, he wanted uh, to get over this, coming back to traditional orthodox theology and explaining to people. Because when people uh, read uh, that, that there is, I mean, uh, orthodox missionaries were very good challenge in Japan. Right when they or, or maybe not orthodox Christian miss, missionaries, I don't remember precisely. When Japanese said, "You are saying to us that there is God who sent His Son, uh, and then He uh, for our salvation, and then uh, this God wanted this Son to be killed because uh, He it, it it has to be uh, sacrificed." What kind of God do you preach to us? So, uh, and Metropolitan Anthony, he tried to explain how, uh, what uh, the Lord did relevant to you and me. 
And also he showed a great, great love for Christ because he uh, pointed that the whole kenosis, right? The whole, uh, boy, what's the word, the Latin word they use for this, uh, incarnation, right? The whole incarnation, uh, 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 it was, it was already, it was for, it was already basically reducing. It was already uh, part of uh, part of. Re it was already redemptive. So, so that was his line of thinking, right? And uh, of, uh, Father Seraphim Rose and Father Herman Podmashensky they came up with definition of basically uh, Stavromachia, that basically it was, it was fighting cross. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair, but it's another selling point to study theological debate in the Russian church abroad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so if we have a theologian in the Russian church abroad of, 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 of theologian of uh, big caliber, that's Voodoo Metropolitan Anthony. I don't think of any other names. Because again, he was thinking, he was analyzing, uh, not analyzing, he was reflecting. But a key to this, we all products of our time, right? We all products of our time. It's, I keep repeating this, but that's, that's I think, reality. Uh, and Metropolitan Anthony, he, his uh, contemporaries, they were, uh, they were converted, uh, converted to positivism or socialism. And one of the reasons why it happened, because uh, they would go to schools where a teaching of a religion were separated from those pupils, from those students' daily life. There would be a dude, right, who would come to class and he would, uh, in, in a boring way, speak about, uh, speak about basically sacred history. So it's kind of would, would be a good way to basically, uh, how to say, to uh, uh, boost uh, a student's immune system against Christianity through classes like that. Uh, do you follow? Uh, I, I'm looking at part. I, 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 I mean, the way it's set up. <laughs> no, I know. No, I'm listening. I should. I should. I should re. I should refocus because it's kind of odd. I, I, I'm sitting like talking in the corner, and so on. I'm sorry. Grouses. So, so is, does this make sense? Yeah, it sounds like you're saying, uh, you know, Metropolitan Anthony. Uh, you know, people. Have, not all the attacks against his teaching were fair, that he had a, a real motivation to try to push back against, you know, the, the, Very good, the yeah. Japanese in particular were objecting to this sort of uh, substitutionary- Or oh, children, or oh, children, you know, the, yeah. the, the, great, great, the great thing is to teach law of God to children. Mm -hmm. Really, because who could ask you, like, I mean, <laughs> with my kids, they're just not buying stuff. They're not just buying, they really say, you know, they, they say what you what they want, so that's that's because with seminarians you kind of people already they, they they want they want to they come here they maybe I don't know what's going on, but it's different. But when you teach for people like outside of Christianity who just would ask you very unusual but very logical very very sensible questions, so Metropolitan Anthony dealing with this. He he wanted uh, to he, he he wanted to 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 preach real Christ. He wanted to 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 teach Christ who was uh, saving, restoring human race, also pushing against uh, this which already became strong and which are, which probably I don't know if I don't would, would know what stage of historical Christ where is this right now I don't know I'm, I don't I'm not talking biblical studies but this idea of historical Christ basically became very how to say boy 
uh, it became very popular, very convincing, especially when you deal with this uh, uh, scholastic, uh, I don't like scholastic, but this is dry teaching about Christ and then basically uh, everything is converted into formula. So like, it's kind of like uh, hate, hell needed to get, uh, uh, what's okay. it? Hades. Hades. Hades needed to get, what's the word they use? Satisfaction? No satisfaction, another word, basically. Ransom, that's what I was looking yeah. for. Yeah. Hades need to get ransom. And when you teach like that, it's really, really, it's almost like basically Greek myths. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of, you you get it, but it doesn't really touch your heart. You kind of, what, what do I have to do with all this? Why is it just because I work Russian or whatever? So, and Metropolitan Anthony, he, uh, his uh, point of reference was Dostoevsky. He kept saying that Bible for the fathers in Dostoevsky because Dostoevsky became, became uh, how to put it, uh, a rescuer for his generation. Somebody who was, because the, one of the strong, strongest characters of Dostoevsky, I'm not a great fan of Dostoevsky, but, but I, I'm giving tributes to him that he was, he was uh, depicting his uh, negative heroes as they would live on their own. He would totally kind of uh, let, he would, he would, uh, he would uh, depict an image of an atheist guy that is, would still very appealing. He kind of wouldn't really influence, he wouldn't mess with it. He would, you, do you follow me, right? Yeah. So, so he, and, and that, that, that kind of shows that he, and that's why he is like, I mean, he, he's who he is. So Metropolitan Dostoevsky became very convincing. In Dostoevsky, he was very much with these moral ideas. Like basically, there is this woman who was making money from lending it to people who, who doesn't do any good. So basically, so it makes sense that I would dispose this lady and so on, nothing happened. And then suddenly Professor Raskolnikov started to realize that he, he cannot live his life. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe in God, there is no God, but he still, he didn't live his, wife, his life. So that's what basically shows that there is something uh, outside of this positivism, which basically, which is something outside of empirism, right? So. So Metropolitan Anthony, that was his milieu, that was his, that was his basically, how to say, his intellectual, uh, intellectual uh, framework. What's the Patrick doing? Patrick doing what? No, no, it's just your background. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's fine. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have No, no, that's okay, you didn't, you didn't distract me. So, so that's important. I, I, I just hope that it takes us it takes us actually, uh, we will have a break in nine minutes. Okay, so, so I mean, the point of all, all, all this, this kind of outline of Metropolitan Entity was to show that he's really big caliber. But I also keep saying a problem of the Russian, not of the Russian church abroad, I mean, the 20th century, that in Russia, Metropolitan Entity would still have. Uh, he would. Uh, he was kind of fish uh, on the shore outside of Russia, because in Russia there would be other people, and there were other people before the revolution who would disagree with his monarchism, who bitterly disagree with his supporting of right wing basically people in Russia, and so on. And that's kind of the naturally rough shoulders. But for Russian church abroad, he became everything, and now you have Jordanville. But basically, people take Metropolitan Anthony as kind of on a level, I don't know, a level on what level, but basically they canonize everything. And and I don't, I'm not sure if Metropolitan Anthony, especially now when he's in future life, he wants us to do this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair, and basically, I don't think it's productive and so on. And I think uh, Father Kiprian's care 
uh, essay about metropolitan engine is the best. It's the best. Uh, it was first published in a magazine that uh, was then uh, started by uh, the future father Peter Hears. And father Peter Hears, he was a novice with, in the monastery uh, with Mitra, the future metropolitan Jonah, Divine Ascent. Like in, I think the second issue, Divine Ascent published this translation uh, of Metropolitan Antony's, uh, of Father Kiprian Kian's memo, mem, uh, uh, memoirs of Metropolitan Antony. And I think that's the best, those, those memoirs. Are, are, I cannot think of anything else. So anything better is that approach Metropolitan Antony. So now we are dealing with adaptation of his legacy right sort of the, the so-called dogma of redemption is not really taught it's never became official teaching there are some people who defend this teaching like Atias Nikolai Artyom a friend of mine in Munich he really believes that this is basically that people misunderstood metropolitan entity and so on uh, but uh, in Jordanville it never really was uh, official teaching but at the same time, Metropolitan Antony's view, his ecclesiology, that's something that became mainstream ecclesiology in the Russian Church. Mm -hmm. That's and, and uh, or without uh, kind of uh, one of the important things regarding Metropolitan Antony uh, that practically he was he was very broad. And luckily, I think our bishop, Vladika Luke, he's also he might kind of, uh, or his ecclesiology is similar to Metropolitan Antony, but his practical attitudes, they, 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 they are often very broad. So I think that's, that's a good thing. So Metropolitan Antony, he contradicted his uh, ecclesiology by saying things, for instance, uh, in England to a future Anglican priest, to Anglican seminarians, you are a future laborer, in Christ Vineyard. I'm sorry, I mean, what are you talking about? If, if they're outside of the church, what do we really mean by this? Is it just a figure of speech? Uh, I mean, how, how is this possible? Did he use one in the past? <laughs> no, no, I mean, he was just, he, he, he just, he just, I want to say, I don't know what he would say, but he, he often contradicted himself, like with Metropolitan Yvlogi, Russian Church abroad uh, pro pro proclaimed the sacraments of Evlogians, void of grace. And then somebody asked him, like my whatever uh, aunt or niece or relative was just married in Paris, was in fact married. He said it wasn't even married. And that's how he was. And that's, I think, that's, I think, orthodoxy. I think orthodoxy because uh, it cannot be just reduced to, to letter. Because that's it's it's very hard to practice because we also can be steer away if you start talking about spirit and so on. But at the same time, if you stay, it's there. It's it basically there is letter, there is spirit. But spirit is tricky because letter is just there. It's, it spells it out. But uh, all kind of problems possible. If, you know, possible to get deluded. Possible to you know to to fly away with this. But nevertheless, I think Metropolitan then teaches us uh, this lesson. So, right, anything, any, any uh, pieces of wisdom that you want to share so that I, I have a little break from talking? Um, anything no. for, anything? Uh, I mean, Metropolitan Anthony, he was, because again, he was a convert, uh, quote unquote. He really was a nightmare for Russian church bureaucracy. Because he didn't have any time for like all those, uh, all those, uh, uh, how to say, uh, boy, what's the word for this? Uh, for uh, following like, official guidelines, like he didn't suppose really to rub shoulders with students and so on. He really supposed to keep this, his distance. And he didn't care about all this. He didn't care. That's why basically they saw him as an oddball. 
But of course, it's attracted a lot of people because he tonsured, he tonsured dozens of, 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 of the future bishops. So like basically the pre-revolutionary generation of Russian bishops, they were in one way or another uh, connected to him. And that explains why he received more, more votes than anyone else to become a patriot. In, in, in the, uh, during the Council of 1917-1918. So, and we, we, and we had him as Roskairark. So here, right, the, the, the Russian Church abroad, founder of the Russian Church abroad. Uh, so, and he was in, in sentimental person. One, one, on one hand, he was cynical. Uh, because his jokes, his things, his, they, they, they were they were clearly cynical. Now. But at the same time, he also was, was sentimental. He really believed uh, in, in in those ideas about holy rules uh, that you might hear in Jordanville. I think they they, they were dear and near to Metropolitan Anthony, sort of. And so it can be explained as some kind of ecclesiastical nationalism basically but of course of course uh, uh, christianity was superior for him so basically superior than anything else and his sermons uh, they are paradoxical they are amazing like for instance his sermon about uh, parable uh, on the on the week of uh, of uh, publican and, and the pharisee that he was pointing out that uh, literally looking at the text, that a Pharisee, uh, a Pharisee uh, left uh, the temple just uh, being less justified than public. And basically, he was making point that Pharisee was doing, still doing good thing, but but I mean he didn't really come as close to an ideal as public did. So he always was paradoxical. He really had a powerful mind. He really had a powerful mind. And uh, whatever he, he said would be interesting, paradoxical. And uh, he would set bar very high, basically, in conversation. But he wasn't, again, he wasn't a scholar in the sense a person who would read and analyze and put footnotes and so on and so on. It wasn't definitely his thing wasn't definitely his thing, but but he was he was a believer. He was he had a very how to say for him Christ wasn't probably a face, it was knowledge. So it wasn't a matter of believing, it's a matter of knowing Christ. But at the same time, he also was very skeptical about like Isichasm. He was really like uh, there was joke, right? Uh, that when they were sitting in Constantinople in 1920, one of the secretaries who later on went to Paris, uh, Amitista, he said, joking to Metropolitan Antony as Vladika, if, if you would now meet St. Gregory Palamas, you would say, you know, Vladika, you wrote all this stuff, it's so hard to understand. I mean, and if St. John Chrysostom would show up, he said, well, really, you are, you, are, you, are, you are great. You're doing all the social work. That's exactly what we need. So, as, and also Metropolitan Anthony, he was in charge of, he was like a hitman sent by the Russian scene. For instance, he was sent to Mount Athos when there was that controversy about Isikhan. Does this, does this? Uh, in yeah, in 1913. So he didn't really have any time for this. So, and then he was to give the uh, Theological Academy and uh, the number of professors who he considered liberals were just sacked. And he also was, when, when he was counterproductive, he really, really supported, uh, su supported superiority of monasticism. He really believed that basically monks, they are sort of special case and so on. He, and he had a lot of mistrust to uh, children of clergy because uh, they just had no choice. Mm -hmm. And he also had a lot of mistrust to people with time. With, with with, I mean, with people who... Uh, time. <laughs> yeah, in a sense, not everyone, but basically I'm saying yes. that people, 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 no, I mean, basically, basically like uh, professors. Okay. Professors who, I mean, 
who would uh, wear a suit and so on and teach classes. So, and, and by the way, the, yes. the expression you used, um, I think you meant uh, hatchet man, sort of the person who does the difficult jobs like that. Hatchet, not hit man. Hatchet, hit man is you pay him to kill somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, that's what I meant. You're saying it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's it. Yeah. All right. So I think I think that takes us to 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 a natural break. So, right, uh, Patrick. How long do you want the break to be? Well, like an hour, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I guess fifteen minutes. That that what it is, right? It's two forty-eight. So uh, it's going to be, uh, what is this? Uh, so 10 minutes before three, right? Okay, 2.50, we meet again. Okay. okay. I'm gonna mute, we come back and so forth. Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, now I would like to ask you to contextualize Metropolitan Antony to place him uh, within uh, everything else we, you studied and try basically to, to reflect, to give me some uh, perspective on him. Um, so uh, when you mentioned about his ecclesiology becoming a party line for rope work, mm -hmm. uh, that was a good observation. I had made a connection. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, if I had to give an overall assessment, I think that Paul and Anthony was, I mean, he's, he's a good man who loved God, but I think he uh, became sort of a, a benchmark in a way that he didn't expect. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair. I just would substitute because I mean, man who love God is good, but it's maybe too general. I would say he was a man who had gift, or maybe he developed this gift of compassion and love. Okay. Because what you know from your classes with Vladika, okay. having read his confession, I think it's quite uh, transparent from reading his confession that he had this. You know, compassionate love for, I mean, for, for any human, I guess, for me. So, yeah, 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 okay. Okay, so, uh, Father Roman. Yeah, um, I always, I always uh, look at this to read also, especially if it's about the church, about providence. And I always uh, look at it that way. There's always a spiritual uh, dimension in it. And uh, I always believe that uh, sometimes if we sometimes if we judge or criticize uh, those who are above us, uh, I always believe that uh, they were put there uh, on the perfect time, I mean, because they were needed for that specific time here. So and I believe uh, because Rocker has to um, really start from sort of start from scratch outside Russia. He needed a man who really had uh, a strong will and a really bright mind. So to lead the church outside Russia. So uh, there could be criticisms of him. It's fine, but it's perfect and. Um, and I, my my observation is, yeah, God puts the right person at the right time. So, so. <laughs> right, 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 right. I mean, uh, 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 history is impossible without critical mm -hmm. analysis. So, if we if we do critical, uh, I mean, if we do like. Uh, this class on sort of historical anthropology of the Rashtrachi brought, we have to approach critically. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I think I agree with your major, with your major thesis that uh, in Russia, Metropolitan Anthony, I can see, I cannot see how he would be useful in Russia, mm -hmm. but somehow in diaspora. 
was a man. <laughs> he was a man, yes. He was a man. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And then again, only God is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So okay, Mr. Patrick. Yeah, if if you if you if you have nothing to say, you don't have to. But I mean, uh, it's kind no, of. No, I think uh, I think I would agree with what everyone else has said. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, and also uh, another thing, right? Uh, we mentioned the ecclesiology that uh, Leo said that the, his ecclesiology became prevalent, and also I would probably say. Uh, again, I, I, ecclesiology is very clear and undoubtedly, but what I'm going to say is not that clear, but it's very likely, highly likely, that monarchism of the Russian church abroad is also to a significant extent, uh, uh, how you call it, in, 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 debt, in, in debted to metropolitan entity. So, I mean, on one hand, Russian church abroad united people who, or included people who didn't see any problems of, of, or who maybe, how to say, who, who, uh, who happened because of the trauma they, uh, uh, they experienced, who happened to, uh, in protective way, to protect themselves or psychologically, they started to idealize pre-revolution of Russia with everything else that was there, and they kind of uh, uh, they kind of minimalized problems that contributed toward revolution. Basically, blaming revolution on the uh, fact that people they uh, so they stopped to be pious and also like uh, outsiders this combination so uh, and people they some of them became uh, monarchists or some of them they never ceased to be monarchists so therefore it was natural but metropolitan antonis uh, believe that that uh, monarchist views is a part of a good Christian uh, profile, right? I think also contributed to this uh, perception that if you are if you are a good uh, practicing Orthodox Christian, by how to say by default you are you are a monarchist, right? So that's something I think that also became feature in the Russian church abroad, and you, as you may see in Jordan with. I haven't been in Canada explicitly. Uh, in Jordan No, you're not here. I haven't had, a, I mean, I've met lots of people more monarchists. I think, uh, I haven't heard it explicitly stated, but I think it's very sick to people connect that with more than obviously, but I haven't had anyone tell me that um, uh, monarchy is an inherent part of being orthodox. Well, you, uh, because probably you never really, your, your, your conversations probably never went in this direction, I guess. Mm -hmm. So if you, but if you maybe talk to some of the people, I think that, that's what, especially those people, if my, my, my expectations, if those people whom you mentioned, they are active church members. I think that's how they would, they would explain that the sacred monarchy is that, and so, and that's just, God pleasing, uh, God pleasing political uh, uh, arrangement. That's what I would expect. Okay, so so this is significance, Metropolitan Anthony, in in many 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 aspects. Uh, what is also uh, what what might be mentioned that Metropolitan Anthony he uh, started this trend uh, appealing to an ecumenical patriarch regarding uh, regarding those uh, 
uh, trends like uh, encouragement on territories of the Russian church and uh, uh, innovations and so on. But he never breached communion and he also believed that uh, Paschalia is a line of no return. Even when monks in Old Valama, they stop to commemorate, he kind of uh, uh, didn't really, uh, he, he never said that Russian church abroad stop, uh, sh should stop uh, to be in communion with new calendarist Orthodox churches. He's sympathetic to those who struggle for Julian calendar. He really sympathetic to them, but at the same time, he didn't see it as a, as a justifiable reason to, to uh, bridge communion with uh, Eastern churches following Gregorian calendar. So, that's another thing regarding him. <coughs> uh, so, okay. I'm curious, is there, a, it seems like Metropolitan Anthony gets really been the, uh, how would I put this, he, his uh, vision, it seems to have more influence than on Rocor than anyone else. Uh, is there a comparable figure for the OCA in Metropolitan Anthony? I think it would be Father Alexander Schmemann. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I think definitely. Yeah, 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 because uh, after Cephaly was uh, his uh, brain child, Father Alexander Schmiermans, and after Cephaly is problematic, it's uh, never accomplished its goal. So, I mean, again, what I said to about Metropolitan Anthony, to, just to be fair, I should be applied to Father Alexander Schmierman. Yes, no one is perfect. So, and uh, life goes on. Life goes beyond Father Alexander Schmierman. Life goes beyond Metropolitan Anthony. So with hindsight of time, we see what didn't really work and both, for both you know, in both cases, and what did work. Uh, so I think our organization of the Russian church abroad by ethnic principle, by ethnic principle, which is, uh, it doesn't correspond to canons because canons follow uh, state uh, an administrative territorial principle, not ethnic principle, because this would contradict uh, polling words that there is neither Jew nor Greek. So, but but if you think about our churches, uh, our churches, they, they all have this adjective and somehow that's how we operate. So for those Russian political refugees, <laughs> This church became, uh, how you called it, uh, Ark of Salvation, the Ark of Salvation. And uh, this church produced uh, a number of people, a number of people who, like, of course, uh, St. John of Shanghai come, comes to our mind, and other people who, who were Orthodox, who were uh, probably saints. I, I cannot see why Father Seraphim Rose cannot be named to Saint Monday. So, so that's 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 probably a good thing. You know, it is a good thing, as Father Ramon said, that he 
that he found in Russian church abroad. The way we look at this, right, we look quite close and we're focusing on problems because this had not been done before because this class is probably the first class like that since before just just within a reach of time just within whatever 10 15 years 20 years maybe to be safe uh, we would talk polemically that would be defense of russian church abroad basically i would so teach Father Roman that he would come back to the Philippines and he would explain why everyone else is wrong and why Russian church abroad is right. Mm -hmm. That would be this kind of education. Mm -hmm. So, I, 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 but I mean, now we can look, uh, we try to look at this uh, philosophically, uh, which means objectively, the best we can. So, and that also would include to not just critically approach, but also try to see with uh, perspective of time achievements of, and since, since the whole class today on Metropolitan Anthony, his achievements, right? What I really like, what, what, uh, what, what I like about him, what impresses me, that he was a man of God. What do I mean by this? That he didn't care what people say. You know, he would say things that would shock people. He would say things that, uh, like for instance, that he stood up for during Jewish pogroms uh, in the late 19th century. He really stood up despite the fact that he was friend of uh, right uh, Russian monarchists. He didn't endorse it, so he still had his checklist in the sense that Christian values would come on top of his uh, priorities. But at the same time, also there is this blessing to Russian fascists, right? Uh, because he saw them probably uh, not for what they were. He saw them as kind of uh, uh, basically uh, vigilantes who, who want to, who, who, who are noble people who, who fight for liberation of Russia, but he uh, didn't uh, see that revolution in Russia, it wasn't something that was exported, it was also part of the profound social, political, and other processes that uh, contributed to this explosion, right? So, and what also probably Russian Church brought took from Metropolitan Anthony, this is a traditional, uh, what so-called Christian, Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo Theodicia, right? Which means um, that uh, justification why I don't need to say what the ADC is, right? Basically, right. everyone. Okay, yeah. So, but but this traditional Christian Geodesia means, I mean, Geodesia means that uh, when it, whenever Israel would uh, would uh, turn away from uh, passes that, uh, that 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 the Lord God uh, prepared for it, right? Uh, Israel would uh, deal with consequences of its choices. So that's what Russian Church brought clearly from the very beginning through, through, the, through the mouth of Metropolitan Anthony preached that Russian people, they suffer because they forgot about God, they forgot about the church that became like a tune line for Russian Church brought and remains but then looking about social injustices in Russia, various other problems in that societies, like also like there was a lot was mentioned about Jewish contribution to revolution as Jewish people were some kind of invaders, despite the fact that they found themselves after Russian empire, a partitioned Poland during Catherine the Great. So, and they remained second-class citizens. So, so, and that kind of, 
this understanding of how things will look from perspective of other classes, of other people, was really lacking and still lacking until, until today. Okay. So. Right. Uh, and Metropolitan Anthony is uh, phenomenal in the sense that he was uh, a head of the three Russian academies in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Kazan. That's also, and he was very, he was quite young bishop, right? He was consecrated bishop uh, uh, in young years. He also, uh, again, didn't really uh, had any problem to speak his mind. He didn't care whether uh, people like it or not, how, how his uh, words would be received. And, and so it's probably, it's probably unfair to call him a diplomatic because I mean, he wasn't a stupid person, but uh, at the same time, he, he really, he wasn't diplomatic in the sense that for him, like he, he was a little bit like prophet maybe to some sense. So, uh, and also interesting that he was a metropolitan. He, he was elected uh, as a metropolitan of Kiev, right? So, so for about a year, he was in charge of the church there. And he preserved his title uh, until his death at Metropolitan of Kiev. He was in charge of the council there in 1918. He didn't have much time for uh, Ukrainian uh, nationalist uh, movement within the church. Those people who wanted to substitute church Slavonic for Ukrainian, again, kind of I think uh, people didn't show enough understanding to those, to those people. And as a result, they founded their own church, which became known as, as a church of self-consecrated people because uh, no bishop was available to perform uh, Episcopal consecration. And they decided that the uh, uh, Holy Spirit descends upon uh, invocations from community. So they, the, the whole community was praying fervently, placing their hands on their candidates, and they believe that how they made a bishop. So an Orthodox Church recognized it, but uh, 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 what I'm always interested, what I'm saying to students, that I don't care how Protestants are wrong, so I, I, have, I, I kind of understand all that. But I do care uh, why we lose people. I do care what we didn't do to preserve those people. And that will be the same question with regarding those people who left into this uh, uh, movement, right? And so that uh, at, the, at the council presided by Metropolitan Anthony, uh, they uh, were not allowed to have uh, uh, larger representations than one or two candidates. They were scandalized. They left the council and as a result, they really feel they, they, they were not obliged of any obedience. So they started the schism. So that's... And while in Ukraine, while in Ukraine, Metropolitan Anthony, he... Uh, he also felt uh, close to leader of the Ukrainian government, Hetman Skaropatsky, uh, seeing in him kind of monarchical figure. It's all this was on Metropolitan Anthony important that he apparently didn't really have much, how to say, taste. He didn't have much. Uh, he didn't care about like people like prime ministers or presidents and how I don't know, but I mean like uh, a leader uh, kind of was was something that he would understand that he would value. So therefore, leader style. If you think about uh, pre-war, uh, pre-second world war to Europe, the whole year, the whole Europe minus France minus uh, England. Uh, 
that consisted uh, minus Switzerland and so consisted of various uh, right governments that had leaders. So those kind of developments, they appeal to metropolitan entity because he saw them as healthy. So he saw them as healthy as something that basically uh, that Russians food or should uh, imitate. Okay, so that's speaking kind of of complexity of his of his uh, character, and uh, he read a lot. He left like I mean many many reviews of books, right? Uh, so he uh, would would read. He would write. He published uh, enormous number of articles and essays and so on that, that I mean, his, uh, his legacy is, uh, is enormous, right? So he probably was like a quick writer. Um, yeah, and he was an erudite. He had good educate, education from a gymnasium. So he didn't have any problem. He was, he was uh, accepted straight into academy. Yes, so he didn't go through the seminary. So he kind of uh, missed, uh, for better or for worse, this part of corpor corporate school because people who uh, would go to the seminary, they would know what they should say, what they shouldn't say. And he kind of missed this part of formation. And that's also why he, was, he wasn't... Uh, whenever you you come across a person who went to seminary, you kind of feel it, see it maybe, but I mean, I don't know how it was about him, about Metropolitan Anthony, because I think he preserved this sort of uh, sense of unbrokenness, sense that he wasn't really, how to say, uh, broke down by that tough uh, school, which it was, uh, which was the case for many of his uh, contemporaries. Okay, so I wonder if what else we can say regarding Metropolitan Anthony, if you want basically to have more uh, kind of uh, have timeline of his life or something like, uh, because I feel like uh, I'm running out of basically things to say about him. So, I think everything has probably been said. We can ask questions. Um, maybe later on, we have another topic that discusses, like, um, I don't know, he probably disagreed with priests like getting remarried. You know, so that's something we'll talk about later, but I'm. I, have a my guess is he probably was not a fan of this kind of oh, talk no no so he was he was as, as father Kiprian here on the road was a great defender of, of canonical rules on one hand he as you remember from your reading with Ladika he would suggest that uh uh, all uh, penance, all suggestions, canonical suggestions, they should be uh, divided by 10, right? Uh, so he didn't really suggest that, that canonical, uh, that penance should be applied as it was uh, suggested in canons. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he, uh, he didn't have much time for people who uh, who didn't follow his image of, of a priest, which would be with long hair, with long beard, constantly wearing ecclesiastical attire, and so on. With this in mind, somebody who, uh, I mean, Maybe it depends on circumstances, but definitely I'm not seeing him as a supporter of a second marriage. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. 
So, so in this sense, also he contributed to this rocker, uh, to this rocker's uh, perception. Father Alexander Schmiermann, in his dear diaries, he wrote that uh, despite everything Russian Church abroad has its style, and that what meant to be style of Russian Church abroad, like you know, priests would always, uh, I mean, show up with pictorial cross. Pectoral cross, pectoral, 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 yes, pectoral cross. So and he would have long hair. So and we have we have one example here. So, so right. So basically, that especially especially graduates from Jordanville, they they were expected to be like that. So and that's something that also connected with Metropolitan Anthony. But consider that that in America, uh, most holy governing synod prescribed for clergymen uh, to uh, not to wear a riasa before the revolution, but to, to have the same attire as Episcopalian clergy, based on understanding that uh, this sort of long hair uh, and riasa and, and head would not be uh, clear to local people, but uh, if they would see somebody with color, it's right away would send the message to Christian minister, right? And I probably told you right that story, like on a train I had a while ago. Yeah. No, I, I was on a train in Scotland, uh, morning or one morning. I had my uniform, uh, so I, there was a man. Who sitting across of me it was like eleven o'clock or something, and he had one beer and he like melted down. And he looked at me and he said, "Who are you?" And I asked him, "What do you think?" And he said, "Rasputin." <laughs> so, so, so that's that's that basically. I I think uh, what Russian church brought brought to America perceived as traditional, whereas in fact in America there already was tradition. That's why a clergy post uh, like uh, uh, from Father Michael Pauk, from North American Metropolia, they didn't buy it. They believe you are actually <laughs> bringing new customs here, whereas now it's perceived, or at least used to be perceived as, as sort of sign of modernism. So uh, it's, it's more complex. And I think things like that, they often escaped, right? Because people based on one understanding, but uh, the same thing also between us and St. Vladimir's seminary. Sometimes we look at their chapel and say, wow, this is kind of ugly and so on, comparing to Jordanville. But then when you start to understand basically Eucharistic physiology, you might see that there is some tradition behind this. It's not just basically happened because they decided to paint something in the spirit of 1970s or whatever. So they really meant also to say something that is traditional, that has point of reference. Right, so I think things like that, they might be not on radars when people just focus on one particular way. And I have, I have great respect for clergy who constantly wear their uniform. I'm not the one of them, but, but uh, I, I, because you, you, you act as a person of the church. You really like, basically, you like a soldier. So I think, I think it's also gives a lot of opportunities to meet new people and so on. So that, but, but, okay, yeah. So shall we, shall we call it the day then? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so tomorrow we're meeting with uh, Father Patrick for a talk. Is that going to be the whole class or just towards the end? No, it's going to be the whole class. We are staying, we are staying, we are, uh, just a second.